Right. Welcome everyone to Zoom for Thought. Uh, this week we are going to have uh, one and only one speaker. His name is Sam Spiro. Um, and he's going to tell us some uh, theorems featuring facts of FFT tables of full frequency. Take it away, yes. Sam. Thank you, Vaki. Yes, and this a, has been a long, Sam. yes, a long talk in the way. We uh, originally planned to do this about a year ago, but it was canceled for uh, non-pandemic reasons, surprisingly. Uh, so I'm happy to finally be doing this. Uh, this is going to be about some, some research I did with uh, Greg Patchell, who's also in the audience, and uh, MR Thought, also colloquially known as Mr. Thought, um, who, as Vaki mentioned, is definitely a real person. Um, and Greg is also a real person. Some people have their doubts, um, but he is also um, real. And again, I am the only one uh, speaking today. Uh, so let me give you a brief uh, outline of what we'll be talking about today. Um, so as you can see, there's a, a healthy mixture of math and uh, silliness which is always what we strive for here at uh, the Zoom for Thought seminar. Um, so let's just get started with this uh, first batch of, of silliness. Um, so as Vaki mentioned, uh, historically this uh, seminar used to be known as the Food for Thought seminar, also known as the FFT seminar. Uh, it's an important part of the UCSD math program for, for a while. Um, and you know, as time progressed, new mathematical discoveries were made. Uh, one such in particular was the fast Fourier transform, which is some algorithm which you don't you know too much about. Um, but already at this point, uh, there's a fairly natural question that I'm sure many of you are asking. And uh, uh, this was posed formally by Mr. Thought uh, as soon as the fast Fourier transform came out. And that was, um, is it possible to give a food for thought talk about the fast Fourier transform? Uh, in other words, is it possible to give an FFT talk about the FFT? So this was um, a long-standing uh, open problem uh, in our seminar. And uh, finally, it was solved uh, in the positive by uh, Alex Goldman, who is a PhD student here uh, last year. Uh, so somewhat more precisely, he gave a talk which was entitled uh, Food for Thought, Fun for Theorists, Fast Fourier Transform. And the reason he chose this very particular title uh, is because you can abbreviate it as follows. So you have FFT, Food for Thought, Fun for theorists, fast Fourier transform. We write it on this cute little grid. Uh, and the observation by Mr. Thought was that in this three by three grid, there are five copies of the word FFT. So you have one in each row, and then you also have two diagonals, which contains the word FFT. This is a very strong uh, solution to Mr. Thought's problem. He only wanted to talk with two copies of uh, FFT in the title, but here we actually get five. So this is a very, very powerful result. Uh, but uh, since Mr. Thought is an extremely combinatorialist half the time, um, he asks, naturally, um, is this the best you can do? Is there some stranger title you can come up with which somehow has six copies of the word FFT? And somewhat more formally, uh, he asks the following, uh, how many copies of the word FFT can you have in a 3 by 3 grid if you're allowing words to appear uh, in rows, columns, diagonals, and will allow the word to be written either forwards or backwards? So concretely, here are a bunch of uh, different grids which give five copies of the word FFT. So uh, this one here is the one I showed on the previous slide. Uh, this one here is what my title is based off of. So I did theorems featuring facts of FFT tables of F of uh, full frequency. Uh, and here we, again, we have uh, the three rows containing FFT, but now some are written backwards and both diagonals. Uh, but you can get much stranger things. So I think like the strangest one is, is this thing here. So you have uh, these two first rows containing it, uh, these two columns containing it, and then one diagonal. So this also has um, five copies, but it's a much stranger beast than, than say, this one. And you can check that all these indeed have uh, five copies. Um, so the, the central question really, uh, that was kind of the pioneering question of the field, uh, was can you cook up a better construction? Can you make a weird title which has six copies of the word uh, FFT appearing? Um, and you might think, based on what I showed before, all these five copies, that that's the best you can do. But shockingly, uh, Thomas Grubb, uh, in a groundbreaking email, claimed that the answer is, in fact, six. Uh, and perhaps what was even more shocking is um, eight minutes later, uh, he said, psych, the answer is actually five. Um, so this, uh, this whirlwind chain of emails uh, really shook up the, the development in this area. And you know, for a while, it was still unknown which of these uh, grub conjectures were uh, correct. Um, and we'll answer the question. We'll, we'll figure out um, whether it's five or six or some larger number. Um, but uh, we're going to 
I'll let you guys sit on it for a bit and you maybe play around with it if you get bored during the talk or whatever. Um, and I want to talk about a bit more of a, a general problem. Um, namely, uh, let W be any word, say of length N, it might be, for example, FFT, or it could be UCSD, or whatever favorite word you have. And uh, if G is an N by N grid, which is filled with letters in some way, we'll define F of WG to be the number of copies of W which appear in some row, column, or diagonal, uh, and written either forwards or backwards. And we'll let F of W be the maximum value of this function as you range over all grids uh, possible. So F W is the most number of copies of the word W you can find in some, some grid. Uh, and just as a very uh, basic example, if you take W to be the word, which is just a constant, so it's just N copies of the same letter A, for example, uh, then somewhat intuitively, the best grid you can do is just fill it all with A's. Uh, if you do this, uh, all N rows are going to be filled with your word, all N columns are going to be filled with the word, and both diagonals. So this F W G function is going to be 2N plus 2. Uh, and this is also the best you can do because there's only two n plus two total word, uh, lines that you could possibly hope to fill in. Any questions at this point with the basic definitions or this little example? Okay, cool. And, and do feel free to, to interrupt me at any point. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's good to point out that the length of the words here are the same as the size of the grids. That's what yes. one of the yeah, core assumptions for this. Yeah, yeah that's a very good point. Yeah, so we're looking at words of length n and um, in an n by n grid. We'll talk a bit more about the more general thing, but this is really going to be the focus. Yeah, that was a very good point. Um, yeah. So, um, right. So we, I kind of mentioned this before, we have this general upper bound of 2n plus 2 for this function, because again, each line can contain the word at most once. Um, and this is a sharp bound. There, the constant word satisfies this condition. Um, so you can ask, is there a sharp lower bound that you can also prove that works for, for general words? Uh, and you can. So uh, the correct general lower bound is uh, f of w is at least n plus 2 for any word w of length n. And the construction is, is pretty simple. Uh, just take your word and write it forward along each of the n uh, rows. Uh, if you do this, you get the n rows by your construction, and it's not too hard to check that you also get the, the two diagonals. Uh, I also should mention that all of the, the pretty tables and stuff you hear, that was 100% Greg's uh, hard work in figuring out how like Tixi and LaTeX stuff work. Um, so that, that's all. Um, but yeah, so this is a relatively simple construction uh, and it gives you this uh, n plus 2 lower bound. So now we know that our answer is always going to be between n plus 2 and 2n plus 2. Um, and like the, the upper bound, this, this lower bound is also sharp. It will show later that if you take a word on n distinct letters, uh, this is the best you can do. So for example, UCSD, that's the, the best construction you can do for that word. Um, so this, these, these bounds are, are sharp in the sense that for a general word, this is the best you can prove. Uh, but you can ask, if I know a bit more structure about my word W, uh, can I prove uh, a stronger bound? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, so one such result in, in this direction, one such, yes, one such result in this direction uh, is that if you have a letter A, uh, which appears many times, say k times, uh, then uh, this f of w function is going to be at least 2k plus 1. Uh, and so, for example, if w had you know, all a's, this would be a very strong lower bound. Of course, we know what the answer is in that case, but that's kind of an indication of like where something like this might come from. And the construction is roughly as follows. So say w is the word baka, which I chose entirely because it sounds like the word, Japanese word baka. Um, uh, so say this is the word. The, the construction uh, works as follows. We observe that um, the letter A, which is our popular letter, appears in the second, third, and fifth index. So to start, we'll write out our word forward in the second, third, and fifth index. And then intuitively, what we're going to do is we're going to try and write the word down each column as well. We're going to try and write our Baca word down here, um, but we'll fail because you know these three things are blocked. But we'll manage to put down the B in this. And then we'll try this again here. And this time, we'll succeed because the A's were in the, the right place. Uh, and then you just keep doing this, and you'll get uh, this, this grid here. And uh, the observation is that um, in rows 2, 3, and 5, we have the word. Also in columns 2, 3, 5, we have the word. And then in this one diagonal, we have the word. And this is what will happen in general. If you look at the uh, k indices corresponding to the letter a, those rows and those columns will each give a copy of the word, giving this 2k. And you'll always have one of the diagonals that gives the 2k. Uh, and in fact, 
Uh, if your word W is symmetric, like the all A word, uh, you can boost this up to 2K plus two. You end up getting uh, both diagonals here. Um, for simplicity, I'll just state uh, this result. All right. So that's one result of using the extra structure of W to prove a stronger way of bound. Um, another kind of structural result we can use is uh, anti-symmetry. Um, so the statement here is a little more complicated. So W is a word such that uh, there are a bunch of indices I, where the ith letter uh, is equal to some letter F, and the opposite letter N minus I plus one uh, is equal to T for K values of I. Then we have this lower bound of F. So concretely, say our word is uh, FTZ FT. Um, then the first letter is an F, and the last letter is a T, so that counts. Um, and here, the second to last letter is an F, and the second to, and the second letter is a T. So uh, one and four are these two positions here that we're concerned with. So the claim is we can get a lower bound of eight uh, for this weird looking group. And the construction here is a, a little more complicated, but uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and briefly walk through it. Um, so again, it's, it's based off of these, these indices where these letters appear. So one and four are, are special indices. So in rows one and row four, we'll write the word going forward. And then also in columns one and columns four, uh, we'll write the word going down. Um, but then we also have this anti-symmetry going. So opposite to one, we have five, and opposite to four, we have two. So in rows two and five, uh, we'll write the word, but going backwards. And in columns two and five, we'll write the word going uh, up. Um, so, and then this middle square never gets used, and we'll just ignore it. Um, call it Q or whatever your favorite letter is. Um, so uh, first of all, one has to check that what I just said is well-defined because I might have like overwritten myself uh, at various points, but you can check it's fine. And then the point is for uh, each of these coordinates where this happens, uh, we get one for the row, one for the column, and then one for the opposite column and one for the opposite row. So for each of these indices, we get four copies of the word. And that gives uh, this kind of thing. So this is supposed to give like a bit of a flavor for how these kind of arguments work. You, have some structure and you want to try to just, just play around. Like, honestly, proving this result, like we had to, I knew how to draw the picture before I knew how to prove this result. Cause you know, it's, it's much easier just to like draw things and like to actually argue why this works is, is a bit of a thing. But in any case, you draw these pictures, you get, you get some bounds. Um, in fact, these bounds are strong enough to prove the lower bound for this general uh, FFT theorem. So uh, the FFT problem deals with the word FFT, so we can, can generalize this. Uh, so here we look at the word W, which has uh, N minus K copies of the letter F to start, and K copies of the letter T at the end. Uh, then if K is at most N over two, this F of W function is exactly the maximum of these two values. Uh, and also note that exactly one of these will be achieved uh, because one is odd and the other is even. And in particular, if you're, if you're doing the numbers at home, um, this shows that the F of T problem, uh, the solution is indeed five. So here N is equal to three, K is equal to one, uh, and the maximum here ends up being uh, five. It's really pleasant to see you've recovered the seminal work of Grubb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it turns out Grubb's conjecture was correct, at least half the time. Um, uh, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so uh, let me talk a bit about the proof. Uh, so the lower bound, we, we've already done. Uh, so if K is very small here, then almost every letter is F. So F is a very popular letter. So this 2k plus one popular letter construction uh, ends up giving this slightly confusingly 2n minus k plus one uh, thing. Unfortunately, we couldn't get nice notation that works for both of these cases simultaneously. Oh well. Um, so that's what happens if k is very small. If k is very big, then roughly the word looks like you have a bunch of f's followed by a bunch of t's. And this is like an anti-symmetric looking word because you can flip it and it goes the opposite. Uh, so when k is very large, uh, it's better to use this 4k anti-symmetric construction and this gives uh, this bound here. So somewhat surprisingly, these two like relatively simple ideas completely gives the right answer for this, this uh, family of words. Uh, and the upper bound is a bit more complicated and requires a good deal of case analysis. And in some sense, it has to, right? I showed you six different constructions, uh, all of which turned out to be optimal and they all look very different. From so somehow you need an upper bound proof that, that works for all these simultaneously. Um, so the idea is to do some case analysis, which I'll, I'll briefly discuss. And kind of the main case to iterate around is how many diagonals are achieved in your theory. Uh, so for example, let's say that G contains two diagonals containing W. Uh, like very concretely, we could say our word is FFFTT. Um, and the observation is once we include this, we've already blocked something. 
So for example, this top row can't contain our word because it has to end in a T, but we've blocked uh, that from happening. Uh, and more generally, the first K rows and the bottom K rows uh, can't contain our word in, in general. And now let's just say we gave up on rows entirely. Um, then the best we could hope to do is to get the N columns and the two uh, diagonals from here. So in this case, the best we could hope to do with this grid is N plus two. And this is basically the trivial bound. Um, and as one I expect, this is, it's never beats the maximum I said before. Um, it is actually sharp uh, in this case because one of our constructions is FFT, FFT, FFT. Um, but in general, it's, it's not gonna beat uh, the upper bounds that I mentioned. So if we give up on, on any rows, uh, we're screwed at, at getting anything better than this. Or one might say we're effed in this case. Um, so um, let's assume then we have uh, one of the middle rows containing uh, this word, say this one. Um, then if we include this, we're again going to be blocking some things. So for example, we can't contain this last column because we want to go F, 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 T, T. Uh, but again, this, this T is blocking us here. So once we contain these middle rows, we're, we're entirely uh, blocked over here. And now it's just a little bit of uh, algebra, counting, whatever your least favorite word is. Um, so how many rows do we have? Uh, so I told you we, we, we've had n to start, but we immediately lost the top k and the bottom k. Uh, so the best we could hope to do for our rows is n minus 2k. Uh, but because we're containing some of the middle rows, uh, we lose k of the n columns. So this is the best we could do for the columns, and we gain uh, 2 for the diagonals. And uh, this is equal to this quantity here. Uh, and you can check for, for the range of parameters we, we chose. Uh, this is at most this quantity here. Um, and that is indeed one of the terms in the maximum, so things work. Um, and that's the extent of the rigorous proof that I'll give here. Um, again, the rest of the proof is you consider one diagonal. Do you contain, say, one of the middle rows? What do you block? What don't you block? And so on and so forth. Um, but it's nothing too, too exciting. Um, and I'll ignore that for now. Um, any questions at this point about anything in life? Okay, cool. So I wanna talk a bit more about some, some more general uh, results you can prove here. Um, several of which I found to be rather surprising. Um, so for example, we know that uh, it's possible for a word to have two n plus two copies, but this shouldn't happen very often. Um, in particular, it should only really happen for the word that is just using the same letter every single time. The question is, can you prove a better upper bound when this doesn't happen? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so one seemingly weak upper bound you can prove is if there's some uh, letter I, or some, if the ith letter is different than the, uh, the opposite letter, for example, say the first letter is different than the last letter, uh, then you can prove this 2n plus 2 to 2n. So slightly better, um, and we'll address if that's actually a good bound or not later on. Um, and again, I won't go through the full proof, but here's roughly the idea. Uh, as you consider how the corners are labeled in this, when i equals one, for example. Uh, and the observation is, if the corners happen to be distributed like this, uh, then we definitely can't have our word appearing in the top row. Because we know the last letter has to be a T, but we're not allowing that. Similarly, the bottom row can't contain the word. So these are two rows that uh, definitely can't contain our word. So the best we could possibly hope to do is uh, two n. Uh, similarly, if the diagonals happen to be uh, looking like this, we would block uh, the two diagonals. And again, the best we could do is two. And more generally, you could argue about um, however many corners you, you have uh, will always block you at least two um, lines, and that gives us one. So again, at first glance, this seems very uh, pathetic uh, of a bound, but it turns out to be sharp um, in some sense. Uh, so if you consider a word W, which uses uh, two letters and which is anti-symmetric, um, in the sense I'll talk about later, um, then this f of w function is exactly 2n. Uh, so for example, an anti-symmetric word would be something like this. Uh, the first letter differs from the last letter, the second letter differs from the second to the last letter, and, and so on and so forth. They're like mirrored uh, versions. Um, and the proof, it, we've already done all the work. So this upper bound is this 2n thing that I just mentioned on the previous slide. And the lower bound is this 4k anti-symmetric uh, bound. Uh, because of the, because we're only using two letters, uh, there are n over two copies uh, or n over two positions where this anti-symmetric condition holds. So just plug n over two into k here, and you get exactly two. So this is another like fairly wide class of words uh, that we immediately know the exact. Uh, um, 
And um, we also showed earlier in the talk that um, if W has some letter, which appears many, many times, uh, then f of w is going to be large. This is this popular letter construction. And it turns out that this is, uh, the converse is also true. Uh, so more precisely, uh, if w is such that each letter appears at most k times, then f of w is at most of this quantity uh, here. And I'll postpone the proof for a second, but I'll note that this uh, gives the following result. Uh, if you have a word w where each letter appears at most n over four times, then f of w is equal to n plus k. So this is immediate from here, we're just plugging in um, k equals n over four. Uh, so that's the upper bound, and the lower bound comes from this general lower bound, which holds for every word w. So this basically says that um, if in w no letter appears sufficiently many times, uh, then you're going to be just trivial in, in some sense. Um, and again, this result is uh, best possible. Uh, there exists infinitely many n where there's some word, where each letter appears at most of one plus n over four times, uh, but you can do better than trivial. It's strictly more than, than n plus two. So this result is best possible. And uh, let me just, again, briefly sketch how you prove this lemma. Uh, so assume uh, G is a grade which contains more than 4K plus two copies of the word W. Uh, maybe two of those copies are in the diagonal, but if you ignore these two copies, then you're going to have uh, more than 4K uh, copies of W, which only appear in rows or columns. Uh, by the pigeonhole principle, either the rows or columns contain more of these. Um, so you can assume the rows contain more than 2K copies. And again, amongst the rows, the words are either going to be written forwards or backwards. Uh, so you can assume that there are more than k of them, which are all written in the forwards direction. Uh, and then the proof is somewhat by picture. Uh, say our word were ABC, and we had we know now um, each letter appears here at most once, and we've written the word forward twice. Um, and now if we try and write the word down any of the columns, uh, we're stuck. Because in particular, this column contains two uh, letter, two copies of the letter B. But we know our word w only contains one copy of the letter. Uh, and more generally, if you try and write the word uh, down any column, once we have this setup, um, you're going to find k plus one letters, which are the same, because we just have this word written the same way, uh, k plus one times down the rows. Uh, so you just you lose out on all the columns. And once you lose out on the columns, the best you can do is n rows plus two diagonals. Um, so this may have been a little fast, but hopefully I get the, uh, the point across. Um, and another observation is that you can improve on this proof uh, if the word W were symmetric, for example. So if the word W is symmetric, i.e. it's written the same forwards or backwards, like FTF, for example, uh, then we don't have to bother doing this step where we consider words written either forwards or backwards. It's the same thing if the word is symmetric. Uh, so we can gain basically a factor of two if the word is literally symmetric. Um, and somewhat more generally, uh, if the word is close to symmetric, in other words, there are S indices where the i letter looks the same as the i plus first letter. Uh, then we get this upper bound here in terms of S. And again, perhaps the most interesting case is when the word W is literally symmetric. Um, and if W is literally symmetric, uh, then we get an upper bound of this form here, uh, where K is the maximum number of times some letter appears in W. Uh, and this turns out to be sharp. So if, if you have a, a, give me a symmetric word W, um, this, is, this is the answer for what the, the F of W. No matter what it is, no matter how many letters you use, this is, that is literally the answer. Um, and like kind of, a, uh, is there something there? Yeah. All right. Um, and kind of like uh, a little observation here is that, uh, in particular, if no letter appears more than half the time, then for a symmetric word, uh, the n plus 2 trivial bound is correct. So we saw on I guess, this earlier slide that um, for general words, if you have something appearing no more than n over four times, then you're going to be trivial, and that's the best bound you can possibly prove. Uh, but if you tell me you're also symmetric, then this threshold jumps all the way up to n over two. So somehow being symmetric makes it much harder to uh, embed it into, into a grid. Um, and kind of a, a curious corollary to some of these general results is the following. So if w is this alternating word, which goes ft, 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 dot, 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 uh, then if I stop at an at odd position, so for example, at uh, FTF, uh, this is a symmetric word where each letter appears roughly half the time. Um, so you're only going to get basically the trivial bound. The trivial lower bound uh, is basically going to be correct. Uh, but if you stop at an even position, say FT, you have an anti-symmetric word. And we know then that the 2N is the correct answer. So somewhat surprisingly, despite this word W like, looking like it should converge somewhere, it, it just jumps in between nearly the trivial lower bound and nearly the trivial upper bound, uh, which, you know, really uh, surprises me. 
Um, so I just kind of emphasize that, like, in some sense, this FW is not, <laughs> not a nice function. It's, it's very sensitive to what kind of structure you have in W. You have to be very careful about uh, the kind of function, the words you're putting in there. Um, OK. Uh, are there any uh, any good questions at this point? Or, you know, we'll yeah. get to non-good questions. No, no, at its, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> well, okay, well, Baki, do you have a good question? Um, you don't have, a, no, no, I know I, you have a question. But yeah, that's not, I, maybe I, not I actually thought I had a good question, but I realized it was a stupid question. I'm going to. Okay. All right. All right, that was a, ooh, that was close. Um, sorry. All right, anyone else have any questions at this point? We're going to be uh, taking a bit of a, a detour. At this point, so you have something now. Now is a good time. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, so yeah, was, Baki. Oh, so, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Please answer, ask your question. I was wondering if you have considered at all a variant where you consider uh, like off diagonals. Like you consider if it, in matrix notation, like a one two, mm. a two three, all the way across to like a n one on the other corner. So like, so it's like we're doing it like on a torus now. It's kind of like what you're. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. No, I don't. No, we definitely didn't. But that is that is an interesting. Question. That is a good question. So, if you know, anyone wants to think about the FFT problem on a tourist, that is a that's an excellent uh, recent follow up question. Um, yeah. Any other uh, real questions before we get to the next slide, which no one saw? All right. So, Bob, uh, you yeah, said you had a question. Oh, <laughs> yes. Please ask your question. Um. How so? How would the overall construction change if you made it like? an n letter word and an n apply an n plus one or n plus two uh by like n plus two matrix if you just have it a bigger matrix would you just be sort of taking the optimal um what's it called optimal solutions and then like mirroring them over to try to get more on the diagonals or so so we'll talk about this um we'll I'll be talking about this in a bit Arby. Um, okay. so that's a very good question but we'll I'll, I'll postpone that for the moment yeah any other real questions before once again I get to that slide that still no one has saw so um, you had a couple yeah. results where it was like, say it was symmetric in S indices, you get this upper bound, and then if it's fully mm -hmm. symmetric, you get that as equal. Like when you were proving this, which one did you figure out first? That's a good question. I think I think probably the symmetric one, and then it was just like, oh, to what extent can this generalize? Gotcha. Um, it's like, like Jesus, like who who looks at this? It's like, oh yeah, this is clearly what the formula is going to look like in in the end or whatever. <laughs> um, so I think I think, and Greg maybe can correct me. But I think we proved the the fully symmetric one. That we're just like ah. You know, to what extent does this generalize? But yeah. And you really can generalize a lot of this. Like, for example, this thing here, you can also like generalize to include like, oh, how much does the second most popular letter improve in, uh, appear? And you can like refine this result uh, further. And you can also refine this and that. So there are many like refinements you can do, but you know, we were restricting ourselves to those that gave us the FFT construction. You know, that was really all we uh, ultimately cared about. Yeah. Good, these are many good questions. Any other good questions before, once again, I go to the slide that no one has seen? All right, so uh, Baki, you mentioned you had a dumb question. Could you uh, just tell me what that dumb question is again? Yeah, uh, so uh, you were, you've been considering kind of like square grids, two-dimensional grids. Have you uh, thought about higher dimensional grids like cubes, for instance? Ah, uh, yes, that's a very good and unexpected question. Uh, yeah, so offhand, I would think this would be fairly hard. I mean, so you saw this FFT thing I only went through some of the casework, but you know, it already has, it has like a good, good amount of like case analysis you have to do. So I imagine, you know, doing something for, for higher dimensional grids, even for FFT would be hard, let alone getting like more general results. So, you know, offhand, I, I think it would be too hard to get like some good general results. Yeah, yeah, actually, I don't, you mind if I just cut in for a minute here? Uh, uh, yeah, um, sure, sure, Greg, yeah. Yeah, so, so Vaki, yeah. I actually think this is a really natural question, at least, you know, to like the, I don't know, to the more infinitely minded or whatever. I do like the larger dimensions, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was, I was thinking about this for the last last few minutes, and actually I was just typing up some stuff, so you may have seen me like glancing away, just doing some typing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, you want to just see, people want to see what I've been writing um, up? Yeah, I mean, are like, you I'm, fine with that, like Lockie? Uh, my... As long as the speaker is fine with that. Then I, I'm yeah down. yeah I'll, I'll find that for a bit yeah yeah sure um, all right yeah, yeah I won't take don't take that long yeah it's fine uh, yeah, cool. so, yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you permissions okay I think you should be able to share you okay know. okay um no, I all right sorry I need I need to compile these oh, my bad sorry uh, <laughs> yeah let's uh yeah okay right right so. Like, like Sam was saying, 
I mean, the, the best you can do for just like two by two. Okay, let's, let's just think about the word FFT, right? To think, start off. Best you can do is five, right? Just to be very clear, like you can do, okay, that's not how that works. All right, you have the three rows and your two diagonals. Okay. Now, there's actually the first construction maybe you would think of for 3D is like, okay, well, you know, you can stack stack three layers on top of each other. So, so here you go. So this notation is just saying like, okay, the first layer is all FFTs and the second layer is like in the same order and the third layer is also in the same order. And this actually gives you 25 words. So maybe that's a little weird to think about at first, but you get like, you have, okay, so it's five in each layer, right? So five plus five, five plus five. So then also you have like two diagonal slices going through. And so you're gonna get five more and five more. So it's five times five. All right, what I, what I mean by these slices, I really mean like, uh, you know, like like this, this column, this column, and this column really form a slice of, of a three by three, but going through the cube diagonally. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is, this, so like, it'd be nice if this was just the best one already, but uh, you can actually do a bit better. So like I, I found an example. Um, Don't you also get space diagonals from that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just saying, like the the you get like a, the sheet diagonal has five within it. But yes, like um, you want to be more specific. Yeah, you get the space diagonals, like like all the way through the middle kind of thing. Oops, yeah, not that one. Oops. Uh, oh yeah, erase. That's a button. Okay. Like F in the first layer, and then another F in the second, and T in the last. Yeah, like, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of like the game set. Actually, you have to have like you know all the same or all different and all the like, coordinates. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Like so, this this is in like one of those slanted diagonals. But yeah, this, this is one of the twenty. Oh yeah, I'm dumb. Never mind. Yeah, I was trying with like the planes, but, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they that's kind of already covered. Level. I'm stupid. Yeah. yeah. No, that's all. Right. That was a good. Good question. Good clarifying question. Um, right. So you, you can actually do a bit better for three by three. So the best example I could I could think of was something like this. And so you actually get twenty eight this way. Um, the best I could I could think of on the spot, but maybe there's a, a better one. If you want to like try it, try it out, then go ahead. I'd love to love to see those better ones. Um, yeah, I'm not going to count them all for you here, though. It's going to take going to be kind of annoying and unclear. Okay, I don't have 28 like colors to, to color with, so um, my <laughs> my color vision's not that good. All right. Um, all right. So, but okay. But like Maki was saying, like. What's really interesting is more so like the, the general case, right? As B goes to yada, yada, yada. Um, but the first thing we should ask is like, okay, how many lines are there actually in the in this hypercube, right? Because that'll give us a trivial upper bound, right? Because even the trivial upper bound here is like, I don't know, not immediately obvious, right? I feel like n plus two, you know, for the, <laughs> or sorry, two n plus two is pretty clear for the square, but I think for the hypercube, it gets a lot trickier to think about. So, but here's a little uh, argument for you, and we'll I'll clarify this on the next slide as well. So, each line in a let's just think about a, a cube to start off. In each coordinate, you either stay the same in that coordinate or you're changing, right? So, we can represent each line as a string of either plus to say the coordinate is increasing, minus if the coordinate is decreasing, or just a number to say that it's that coordinate in every spot, and so. If it's three by three by three, you would get five cubed such triples, right? You have five choices for each plot because you can either be plus, minus, one, two, or three. Only have three, three slots. So, but the issue is that not all of these five to the d lines are actually lines. So some of them are points. Like if you have a point three, two, one, that's not a line. It's not moving anywhere. It's just a single point. So you have to get rid of those. And the other issue is that you double count. So I mean, a line going forward and backwards is actually the same thing. And so you have to divide by two afterwards to get the number of lines. So what's interesting is that you do asymptotically get uh, five to the D. So three to the D is you know, small in comparison. Or sorry, I should say one half five to the D is what you get asymptotically, which is the rate of growth we got with the stacking construction, right? With the stacking construction, you get this five X whenever you stack like this. And so it's kind of interesting, like somehow that gets you sort of close to what it should be, but you, you know, it still feels like you should be able to do something more clever than just stacking cubes like this. Okay. Um, right. So I just wanted to clarify this notation a little bit. So I don't know if someone, 
in the audience. If you give me an element of <laughs> this cubed, I can show you what line it is. So I don't know. Any any volunteers? It can literally be anybody. It doesn't have to be like Vaki or Sam, but Vaki would be fine. <laughs> I'll do. Um, one plus minus. All right, so that's a that's a nice tuple. Good line, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this so this line is going to have okay. So how's it going to start? So the first coordinate will always be one. The second coordinate will go one, two, three. So it'll be an increasing order, and the third coordinate will be in decreasing order of three, two, one. So let's see. So the first, so I should start at one, one, three, and then it'll be one, one, two, two, and then one, three, one. So let's let's find this in the in the picture. So we have one, one, three, uh, one, two, two, and one, three, one. All right. So this is a it's a diagonal on one of the faces. Right. Yeah. And I, I think maybe doing it this like looking at the picture helps you kind of think like okay, this is actually this actually does make sense. Uh, thank you, thank you, I appreciate the volunteerism. Okay. The selected volunteerism. <laughs> hey, you know, you still gotta, you know, gotta encourage it, you know, positive reinforcement. There you go. So, all right. Okay, so this this gives us a, you know, a kind of a, a loose upper bound, right? This one half phi to the D upper bound. Okay. Now, really, I would like some asymptotics though. So, oh yeah. Actually, I actually don't want to talk about this constant yet, but um, I wanted to find this function pi though. So, so pi i of p, this is going to be the number of coordinates that are equal to i. So like if, if d was six, then my coord my points have six coordinates each. And so like pi two of this point is two, just because there's there are two twos in that tuple. Okay. Okay. And now actually this this has enough stuff on it already to define a grid for you. So I know I know I have this mysterious constant C, but now we'll talk about that later because it fits into the argument. Trust me. Okay. So this this grid. So there's gonna be a grid for each dimension D. So that's why I have this index D here. Um, so this is okay. This is the condition where the word is W1, W2, W3. Um, so what is this thing? So pi one plus pi three, right? These are the number of coordinates that like could be endpoints. In some sense, right? Because like most lines, right? Like most of the coordinates are going to end in ones and threes. So those are those are indicating like you're at the edge of the cube, right? Where there where there are ones and threes, and you're adding, so you're just saying it can be either or. And then this this thing is just a, a parity thing because I want some of them to be the start of words and some of them to be the end of words. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the idea. And then everywhere else we just fill in with the middle letter, so that we'll get lots of words. Okay. And uh, I only, so this, this greater than C thing, I only want, the only endpoints I want to actually be endpoints are ones that have like lots of coordinates that could be endpoints. Okay, so they're, they're ones that are like really more like corners. So here's, here's an example for you. So let's say the word is ABC, very nice word. So our, our grid again would turn into this. So again, what's the idea? So actually, so actually, it turns out for, for d equals three, the only way you can be bigger than c is if you have the number three. So to be something that's a or c, you have to have all of the coordinates be one or three. So the only things you get are like the actual vertices of the cube, so like these and then the same thing down here. And then whether you get an a or a c just depends on the parity of how many ones there are. So for an odd number of ones, you get an a, and for an even number, you get a c, okay? Now, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're if you're an expert line counter, you may be wondering, like, okay, you know, you're like you're trying to figure out where all the lines are. And actually, you can come up with a nice little, there's a nice little argument for counting the lines for this grid. So there are four A's and four C's. And every pair of the A's and C's form a line here, or form a word, I should say. Right? So I mean, if I take, okay, this is pretty clear in this, in this slice, right? You just get ABC. But I mean, even with this C and this A, this B is in the middle. And so you get a, a diagonal all the way through. And so, I mean, there's four of each. And so we have 16 words. Okay. Now this is, a, <laughs> this is disappointing, I think at first, because it's like, oh, 16 is less than 25 and it's less than 28. So it's, you know, not that good. But uh, this, this construction is more of an asymptotic construction than like a 
uh, specific construction. Okay, so there are some uh, some lemmas that are more specific relating to this, actually. Actually, maybe I should mention uh, something just right before this. So now I'm going to get the order wrong if, if I start talking right now. Okay, so let's just do this. Okay, so the first lemma. Okay, so if you have a, a point in the grid I described, and R is, okay, so it's the number of like, you know, good coordinates or whatever. Okay, you call it the rank or the weight or something. Uh, I guess R, it's R, so let me just call it rank for now. Okay. So if R is, you know, a little bit bigger than C and a bit less than, and but not too much more than C, so that's like C, R is close to four fifths. Um, then GD is is guaranteed to have two to the R minus one words with that point as an endpoint. So, for example, all these vertices, right? So R is three for them, right? Because there's three coordinates that are one degrees, and so two to the R minus one is four, and that four is just saying there are four lines coming out of it, right? Which is just what we, I just said like a minute ago, right? There's there's the four other corners it can point to that give you a word, A, B, C. So this lemma is is very, very sharp for this particular example, which is nice. Um, but asymptotically, it also it also works. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing you want is, OK, so the first one's saying that for each point, there's a lot of lines coming out of it. And this lemma is saying there are a lot of these good points. OK. Um, so given, again, given this rank is close to 4 fifths, there are at least asymptotically d choose r times two to the r points uh, with that rank. And so again, actually, this is exact for our example. So where r is three and d is three, the mention is three. So you get three choose three, and two to the r is eight. That's oops, I actually can't draw outside of the slide and edge. But okay. Anyway, this is eight. And okay, again, what is this eight saying? It's saying how many points are A's and C's. Well, you know, there's four up here and four down here. That's eight. So again, it's sharp. So at least it's reasonable that these are true. Okay. And now, basically, you can put these two things together. So if you if you add this up, okay, let's do, let's do some uh, arithmetic here. Actually, there's an issue though. So you can't just add these up. Like if this is the number of points and the number of lines coming out of the points. But you double count because like you have two endpoints and you're counting the line between them twice because there's thing of it coming out of each endpoint. So you actually need to add an extra one half out here. Anyway, so you have okay, D choose R. And well, it's also bringing out another one half because it's two to the R minus one. So we have a four to the R. And we can imagine a one to the D minus R. And we're summing over a whole bunch of R values. So you think this should be about one quarter, five to the D. And right, that's that's the binomial theorem. It's great. And in fact, the way we chose these estimates actually doesn't basically you get the, the right asymptotics, even though you're only summing over a range, because as as D gets really big, you just get like a really spiky binomial distribution, just like really concentrated towards that four fifths. And it's four fifths because it's four and one, right? It's, Four to five. Okay, and so that's the the theorem. So if you choose these, you know, delta and delta primes and blah blah blah. If you choose everything correctly, then it, the asymptotic construction does give you one quarter of five to the words, which is very nice. Now I'm not going to prove these results as they do not fit in the margins of the slide. Um, yada yada yada. Um, but maybe I should just make a quick comment. So. Uh, I do expect all these arguments to work for the general length n words as well. However, there, there's probably some more technical issues. Like uh, you're gonna want something like the, I mean, the grid we saw, you have a whole bunch of Bs, but if you had like A, B, C, D, you need a whole bunch of Bs and Cs in the middle. And so you need somehow to make sure that they're equally put in the middle and uh, and you're actually gonna get still a lot of words. But I think the technical details should all, should all work out anyway. And do you think like ultimately we could get like the right asymptotics for any given word with this method? Oh, so uh, are, what, what are you saying exactly? Like, because uh, this is, I guess this is 
I guess technically I'm only, I'm only saying a lower bound here. Right? So maybe I should say like right. Kind of but it least. seems to me like this, like this stupid corner argument I made before could generalize to higher dimensions and show that this is the right asymptotic upper bound for the, F, the word FFT, for example. Right, right. Yeah, there's going to be something about the uh, the anti-symmetry that's going to that's going to break yeah. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So this should be not just greater than and asymptotically. It should be like actually asymptotically. Yeah. Oh, uh, the typo worked out. That's nice. Yeah. I, I assume that you um, you uh, texted your favorite editor from AMM to say that you figured this out in three minutes or so. <laughs> And that's well, that's what's appearing in AMM. No, no, no. I, actually, it's it's more like I mean, where else would you submit such a problem, right? It's about FFT. You gotta find a journal with AMM. Obviously, it's such a nice problem they would accept it. Very good. Right? Yes. So, no question. Yeah. Okay. So th there was just yeah. Yeah. Given that I'm just assuming it will appear. That, that's completely what reasonable. Here. A completely reasonable and professional <laughs> yeah. thing to do. That's how it should be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But that's that's all I have to say. Maybe people have have questions or or something. Uh, let us first thank our one and only speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> oh, oh okay, yeah, sorry. Okay. Wait, are we out of time? More slides, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Sam. I didn't mean to take Oh, gotcha. Time. Okay. Well, let, okay, us no, thank, let us thank Greg for the interruption. <laughs> Any questions for Greg? Yeah, if anyone has questions about higher dimensional stuff, though, now is the time. I'll very briefly talk about where the class is up. Well, maybe for the moment, I'll just uh, take control. Okay. Uh, yeah. I have, I have power. Um, yeah. So thanks, uh, Greg, for that shocking and unexpected development. Um, and this last little thing I wanted to talk about was um, this thing that uh, Arby kind of mentioned of like, what if you have a, a shorter word in a, a longer word? So, for example, if your word's cap, you know, a seemingly reasonable construction is to just take like a, you know, a good construction and just kind of like mirror it on the other side. For example, you can do this in a five by five grid and get a lot of answers. Um, and you can ask, you know, asymptotically, how many cats can you fit in a grid? Um, you know, this is a, an important problem in, in category theory uh, with many applications. Uh, you can consider the problem for dogs if, if you're more of a dog person. Um, and more generally, you can define this function to be the maximum number of times W appears in an M by N word uh, grid, where we think of W as having some fixed length. But <laughs> yes, thank you, Vaki. Yeah, so Holy might be uh, instrumental in improving this, uh, this theorem. Um, and the short answer is we don't know how to prove anything, uh, even like, exact, let alone asymptotic for like anything, uh, but we can get surprisingly close. So here's a complicated function that I'm not gonna explain, um, but the point is that it's upper and lower bounded by this function FWN1, which is the maximum number of times you can have W appearing in a one dimensional grid. So here we're doing a, a two dimensional problem, but it turns out if you can solve the one dimensional problem, you can get reasonable bounds. Um, in particular, under suitable conditions, you can get these uh, upper and lower bounds here for this uh, short word function, which is off only by a factor of and the, the proof is, is relatively short. Uh, so for the lower bound, just take your optimal one-dimensional construction and write it along each row. This gives you many, many copies along the rows. It also turns out to give you about as many uh, along each uh, diagonal. And for the upper bound, you again just say like, well, in any given row or column, the best I can hope to do is you know the maximum number of things in any uh, line. So if you fiddle with the numbers, you'll get the, the result. Um, and I'll just conclude with two um, and you do the same with the diagonals as well. Uh, I'll conclude with two uh, brief questions. Uh, the first is, uh, so this corollary only applies if we know some asymptotic limit for this uh, function. And the question is, um, does this always happen for every word? I would think so, but you know, we've seen some weird examples uh, where words don't behave quite as like we hope. Um, and slightly more generally, uh, can you compute what this function should be? This like just one, oh, sorry, one dimensional problem. Like, can you solve the one dimensional problem in terms of like simple parameters of the word W, even just asymptotic? Um, and I haven't thought about this too much. It might not be that hard to prove ultimately, but it's something we don't know. Again. And the other big question is whether this like uh, lower bound or this upper bound is closer to the truth um, for any word really. Um, and in particular, um, if W is the word with K distinct letters, we don't know what the answer is. Uh, we suspect that it is the lower bound. This just like dumb construction of just writing the thing in each dimension, but we don't know how to prove this. Um, and it, it could very well be the case that the correct answer is this lower bound for everything. The best you can do is just asymptotically, at least, is just write a good one-dimensional construction and just um, do that in every row. That might be the best, but we, we don't have to do this. Um, at one point, I thought I could prove this result for the word AB, um, but I didn't really write it down. And you know, it's not that impressive a result anyway, but like even for the cat problem, like we genuinely do not know what the answer is for cats. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see any papers regarding cats. Um, and, this. Um, and the last 
Uh, very last thing I'll close with is this. Um, I, so while Greg was talking, I briefly updated uh, Mr. Thought. Uh, sorry, Mr. Thought briefly updated his website. I did not update his website. Um, that would be silly. It, I mean, he it's hosted on my website, but like ignore that. Um, so yeah, so you're, you're his that, advisor, you know. so naturally you would link to his website, of course. Right. Yeah. So as Vaki mentioned at the beginning, like he's he's our student, but also we're his students. It's a cyclic uh, relationship. Anyway, uh, so I just added this paper to the previous thing. So um, yeah, you have this this we have this problem, which uh, you know started out as a joke, and it like genuinely got accepted by a good mathematical journal. Um, so this just goes to show what you can uh, do if you if you strive hard enough and or go to UCSD. Um, and with that, I will genuinely end the talk. All right, let us now uh, once and for all thank the speaker. Uh,